throughout this uh, particular teaching, but this is very fascinating. We're going to be looking at these four Gospels for just a brief moment and seeing the difference. Now, if you read the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is seen as the lion. The book of Matthew was written for the Jews, and Jesus is prophesied as the king of of the Jews. Listen to this. Hosea, or Matthew 21, 5 says, Tell the people of Jerusalem, Look, your king is coming to you. Now, who is he speaking about? The Jews. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. So the Lord says, Your king is coming. And as the Messiah... He fulfilled hundreds of Old Testament prophecies given to the Jewish people. And among other things, he was seen as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Revelation 5.5 5 talks about that. The lion from Judah. Now the lion obviously represents power and strength. He is the king of the beasts. And in the same way, Jesus is the king of all kings. He cannot be defeated. And there are many characteristics about a lion, but number one, they are bold and they are fearless. Would you agree with that? I know that to be so from my safari in Uganda when we saw lions and five or six lions were eating a, a water buffalo. Nothing uh, was uh, of concern to a lion. But everything was running away from it. It was truly the king of the jungle. Proverbs 28.1, The wicked uh, flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. What does this have to do with you and I? Two things, two areas of practical application. Number one, be bold in prayer. I'm not talking about telling God what to do, but we can be bold to remind God of what He has said in His Word. God, you have said thus and so. I stand upon that. Listen to this. Hebrews 4, 16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. He tells us to come boldly. For what purpose? That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now let me just say, there is a difference between boldness and arrogance. We're not telling what God what to do. We are reminding Him, you've said this, and I hold you to that. Remember when Moses was talking to the Lord about the Israelites, and God said, they're your people, you brought them here, and I'm going to destroy them. Most of us would have said, God, they deserve it. Have a good time. But Moses had a pastor's heart, and he said, Lord, they're not my people. They're your people. You called them. You need to give them mercy. And that is exactly what God did. Why? Moses was bold in prayer. So God beseeches us, come boldly to the throne. And then secondly, be bold to witness. Many Christians live their entire lives and never share their faith. They never tell anyone of the goodness of God. But notice Ephesians 6 says this, verses 19 and 20. Paul says this, Pray for me that the power to speak may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I might speak boldly notice this as I ought to speak that I may speak boldly as I ought to we ought to be bold about the things of God listen to me right now the world is bold about sin and self the world is bold to preach their beliefs and their wares. We should be bold, not arrogant, but bold to stand up for righteousness and godliness. When you're self-conscious, you're afraid. But when you're God-conscious, you're bold. Now, I believe in being wise. I don't want to be 
talking to people out in the world right now and, and just being arrogant, pushy. You've, heard, you've seen Christians do that. One pastor said it's not witnessing, it's nit witnessing. You know, just someone that's always just blabbing their mouth and so forth. But listen, I'm telling everyone this year, Merry Christmas. Now, they may or may not say that, and if they're not Christian, that's okay, but just Merry Christmas. You know, Happy Holidays, well, Merry Christmas, and they just say it back. But I want to be bold to share Christmas is about Christ, the reason for the season. So we need to be bold to share the Lord and tell of His goodness. So in Matthew, Jesus is seen as the? In Mark, He is seen as an ox. Now, why is that? Here's the reason. Matthew's gospel was written to Jews. Here's a phrase you always saw in Matthew's gospel, that it might be fulfilled. You see that in Matthew? That it might be fulfilled. Why? The Jews knew the Old Testament, and Matthew would say, this is what the Old Testament said, Jesus fulfilled that. Now the other writers didn't do that because they were not writing to Jews. The Gentiles didn't know the Old Testament. The Jews did. So in Mark's account, Mark was written for Gentiles. And he is seen as the lowly servant. Listen to this. One of my favorite verses. Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve to serve others, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus did not come to be served. He came to serve. We live in an entitlement society right now. What are you going to do for me? What are you going to give to me? And many people come to church with that. Church, bless me. Pray for me. Help me feed me. And that's not wrong. But as you grow in Christ, you don't come just to get something. You say, Lord, what can I give? What can I say? What can I do? How can I be your hands and your feet? This weekend, we probably had 60 to 70 Bereans, young and old, men and women, serving in the kitchen, serving in the parking lot, serving here in, in, the, in the particular rooms we were in. They were awesome. Our people have caught a vision for servanthood. It is a blast to serve the Lord by serving His people. Now what's interesting is in Matthew and in Luke, we see the genealogy of Jesus Christ. All the begats that we skip over at the beginning of the year, right? Well, in, Ma in Matthew and in Luke, we see that. But listen, in Mark, we do not see that. No genealogy, no elaborate record of his birth. Here's why. After his water baptism in chapter 1, Jesus goes straight to work healing the sick and ministering to the hurting. Mark wastes no time. Okay, we know Jesus was born of a virgin. Okay, let's go into ministry. He shows him as that servant. Jesus is the example of being a servant. He washed the disciples' feet. And, you know, that's not a great job in our day and age. But think of how they got around. They walked everywhere. And what did they have? Now, in our roads, we have oil slicks, things of that nature. What do you think they saw on their roads? A lot of manure. It was the lowliest servant's job, the bottom of the barrel. You're the new kid on the block? Go wash feet. Jesus took the time to wash the disciples' feet. Now, what does this have to do with you and I? Number one, be willing to do things that seem menial. I've had people say, I can't do that. I'm a teacher. Well, study the ministry of Jesus and the disciples. The same disciples that raised the dead, healed the sick, and cleansed the leper did a lot of menial things as well. You know, last night a lot of us were doing menial things to turn this back around into a regular church service again. And the Bible says in Romans 12, 16, do not be proud, but be willing to do menial work. Do not be conceited. You see, nothing should be beneath us. You may be too busy to do some things, but nothing should be beneath you. I don't do that. Jesus did. He was a servant to his fellow human beings. And then secondly, 
realize that the best way to reach those in the world is to serve them. The best way to reach people is to serve them. It's interesting that many times the world knows what we're against, but they don't know what we're for. Oh, they're against this and that and the other, but they need to see that we love them enough to serve them, to care for them, to reach out to them. Many of you know Mike Huckabee, who's had a television show, former governor of the state of Arkansas, ran for the presidency, I believe, a couple of times. And someone told me the true story of a time when they went to a large church in Arkansas, and uh, we have people as parking lot attendants, but they actually had a golf cart. And uh, they would drive people in from different places and bring the, or for different parking areas and bring them to the church, drive them up. And one day a woman got onto a cart and looked at the man and said, you know what? You look just like my Huckabee. And the man said, you know what? I, I hear that a lot. <laughs> and uh, so a little bit later she said, man, you just look like him. I, I have seen his show. You really look like that. Yes, ma'am, I've heard that a lot. And just kept driving. Finally gets up to the door and, door and she said, are you Mike Huckabee? And he said, yes, I am. <laughs> and I said, here's a man that was the governor of a state, ran for president, but on Sunday mornings, he's driving a golf cart, taking people to church. That's a man that recognizes that he's a servant first. I like that. Uh, Evelyn Niles is Joe Morris's mother, and uh, many years ago, her, her husband died and he had been a doctor, so she came to Rhema uh, around the same time I was, and at that time, Kenneth Hagin was one of the foremost prophets in the world, well-known, and he, he was just, he was the man, Brother Hagin. And so we were there at Rhema, and she was at the lunchroom with the Rhema teachers, and she was still mourning and, and grieving the loss of her husband, and she had a, a, a pop bottle or, or can, and she was trying to open it, and she was flustered, and she couldn't do it. No one else noticed her because she was a nobody. No one else bothered, but all of a sudden, a man walked over quietly, came over, opened it up, and gave it back to her. She looked, and it was Brother Hagin. And I thought, here he was, you know, the man of great faith and power, but he noticed a woman in distress and came over and served her. That says something. You know, the, the ministers that I know that really are in it for the long haul, what I find is their servants. You know, we try to serve our ministers well when they come in. Do you want this and that? We really don't have demanding people. Whatever you give me is fine. Let me just love on the people. Let me just minister to them. That shows the heart of a servant. Listen to this. Regardless of our title or our position, we must always remember that we are first of all servants of the Lord. Romans 1.1. 1, 1. I love this. Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. Notice something. He talked about his apostleship second, his servanthood first. You know, sometimes we can use our position as a title. I'm a doctor. I am a teacher. Whatever the case might be. But when you come through these doors, we are servants of Jesus Christ. All those other things go by the wayside for that season. So that was Mark. He showed Jesus as the ox or the servant. Now we come to Luke and he is seen as the man. Luke was written for the world, but he's not just seen as the man, he's seen as the perfect man. Luke 1 verses 3 and 4, having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I also have decided to write an accurate account for you, most honorable Theophilus, so you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. Now, if you know anything about Dr. Luke, he was a medical doctor, and he, it's been long accepted that he was a diligent historian. He was not there like the other disciples, so he did his research. He did his homework to make sure that what was said was accurate. He showed that a Christian's faith is based upon historically reliable, verifiable events. Now, I understand that we trust the Lord with all of our heart, but we can prove certain things by verification. And I like something about Luke. You know, the Bible would say Jesus healed a man with a withered hand. Well, when, you read, when you read Luke's gospel, he would say it was his right hand. Why? A doctor would notice that. 
And so he talked about Jesus being a man, but listen, a man without sin. He was called over and over the Son of Man in the Gospel of Luke. Listen to this verse, 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin for us. Hebrews 4.15, this high priest of ours understands our weaknesses for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. That's amazing. And lastly, 1 Peter 2.22, Jesus never sinned nor ever deceived anyone. Jesus was a man, but he was a perfect man. That's why he alone can be the mediator. No one else was perfect. Fully God, but fully man. Now what does that mean for you and I? Practical application. Be transparent and real. Back in the early days when I was in Bible school, we were taught about speaking our confessions of faith, and I believe in that. I believe you can have what you say. But here was basically what we would do. How are you doing? I'm blessed. How are you? I'm highly favored. How about you? I'm doubly blessed. There's nothing wrong with saying that, but there was nothing real about it. I mean, it was like the plastic people. There's nothing wrong with saying, you know, I'm struggling right now. Can you stand with me? Can you? No. Now, you don't want to do that all the time, but if you're struggling, be real. Be transparent. People try to hide things. I don't want people to see what I'm like. You know what? We see what people are really like. We can see through that facade. Rick Warren said this, authenticity is the exact opposite of what you find in some churches. Instead of an atmosphere of honesty and humility, there is pretending and superficial politeness but shallow conversation. People wear masks, they keep their guard up, and they act as if everything is rosy in their lives. It is only as we become open about our lives that we experience real fellowship. I know for Pastor Stephanie and I, we don't try to be something we're not. I was kind of taught in the early days, you know, with, when it comes to church services, and I had pastors that did this, come out after the worship. The moment that the service is done, run out the back door. You don't want people to see the real you. I believe people want to see a real human being like them that has good days and bad days and highs and lows, but still continues to serve Jesus. I don't pretend to think that you think I'm perfect. If you have, you must be a first-time visitor. But the reality is this. You know, when you watch TV, it's funny because you see a TV show and say, my, my TV preachers never make mistakes. Yes, they do. They delete them before you ever see that broadcast. You know, you just see everything just perfect, picture perfect, but that's not reality. I'd love to work for so-and-so. Their ministry would be perfect. No, it isn't. No ministry is perfect. And if it was, when you got there, it ceased to be perfect. But the reality is this. God uses imperfect people to do His will. And Stephanie and I are just that, striving like you to please the Lord. And last, the other, the other application here is remain teachable. You know what I've found? No one is unreachable as long as they are teachable. But I know people, they just will not listen. They want to tell you, they want to tell me what to do, but more than they want to tell God what to do. God, if I were you, I'd do it this way. You're not God. And how many times he doesn't listen to all of those demands? But here's the reality. Be teachable. Let people that you love and that love you speak in to your life. Well, I can hear from the Lord. Yes, you can. But listen, sometimes we just need a flesh and blood person to say, you know what? Be careful here. You know what? Don't go down that path. We need those people in our lives. And I can feel the excitement right there. Hold back the enthusiasm. And then lastly, in John, Jesus is seen as the eagle. The book of John was written for the lost. Here Jesus is seen not as the Son of Man, but as the Son of God. In fact, we know exactly why John was written. John 20, 30 says this, Jesus performed many other signs 
in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, here's the purpose, that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's the purpose. That's why we tell people, if you're a new believer, read the Gospel of John. Because it shows people he is the Son of God, and if they believe in him, they can have eternal life. I don't want to get too technical, but there's a word that is used about Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Does anyone know what that is? They're called the synoptic gospels. There's a test later on. Say that with me. Synoptic gospels. Gospels. And all that means is quite simply, the word synoptic means a scene together. They are similar in their formats. You'll find the same stories in Matthew and Mark and Luke. The same parables in Matthew and Mark and Luke. Different nuances, but the same basic stories. But the Gospel of John is different. Uh, a, a couple of examples. John contains not one parable. Not one parable. Also, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are written in chronological order. John is topical, not chronological. Different format. The number seven stands out in John's gospel. The number seven stands for what? Completeness or perfection. That's right. And so just, I won't go into all of this, but listen to this. There are seven witnesses in John that actually illustrate uh, that Jesus is the Son of God. Seven different individuals that illustrate that. Specifically seven. There are seven miracles or signs that are recorded in that gospel. No more, no less, just seven. They were selected to reveal His glory. There are seven I am statements in the gospel of John. Help me out with some of them. I am the bread of life. I am the way and truth in life. I am the uh, good shepherd, the light of the world. Seven different I am statements. And really when he was saying I am, he was saying I am God. And then it's interesting, we all know what John 1 is about. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God. But you know there are seven names or titles of Jesus just in John 1 alone. In John 1 alone, he's called the Word, the Light, the Son of God, the Lamb of God, the Messiah, the King of Israel, and the Son of Man. But here's the interesting thing. What's John 1 all about? In the beginning was the Word, but then it says this, verse 14, So the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Another translation says, So the Word, that is deity, became human Humanity was added and made his home among us. So when you're reading the Gospels, there are different emphases. In Matthew, he's the lion or the king. In Mark, he is the ox or the servant. In Luke, he is the man or the son of man. In John, he's the eagle or the son of God. Now, it's a little harder to get practical with that point because you're not going to be the Son of God. But here's the reality. 1 John 3, 1 says this, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. How do you see yourself? As a nobody? As a failure? One of my favorite stories is the woman with the issue of blood. You know, she had spent all of her money. Doctors couldn't help her. She, they, all they did was take her money, really. And the Bible says she touched Jesus. And in the world's eyes, she was absolutely a nobody. She was not allowed to be there. She was unclean. She took a risk even in going out in public. She could not get to Jesus standing up, so she crawled on her hands and knees. We've got a picture of that in the foyer, but the reality is that that shows about four people in Jesus. The Bible says a, a crowd thronged him. He could hardly breathe. And when he said, who touched me? They said, are you kidding me? Hundreds of people are around here touching you. But this was the touch of faith. She crawled in the ground. She crawled up. She could not touch his person. 
She just touched his garment. And this is what Jesus said. He said, somebody touched me. Jesus caused a nobody to become a somebody. And you may feel like a nobody, but when you come to Jesus and touch the hem of his garment, you are no longer a nobody. You have become a somebody. Now are you the sons and the daughters of God. You may not feel like it, but you are a child of the King. And Romans is so bold that it says you are an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. Do you deserve it? None of us deserve it. But you've been brought in. So in the Spirit, there is the Father. On the right-hand side, there is the Son. And right beside Him are you and I, children of the King. You know, when my kids come into the house and they want food, they don't say, may I please have a bagel? You know, Dad, would you mind if it is? You know, it's their house. They're part of the family. They were born in. They come in. They take what's theirs. I came in. Victoria was wearing my shirt. I said, that's my shirt. Well, guess not anymore, Dad. Thanks, you know. That, the reality is they have a mentality, not arrogance, but they have a mentality. I'm in this family just as much as you. Well, we need to rise up and say, I am a child, a son, a daughter of the Most High God, an heir of God and a joint heir of with Christ. I'm going to rise up in my authority and be everything he's called me to be. I'm not a servant. That's the Old Testament. I'm a son or a daughter of the King of glory. Jesus was multifaceted. Listen to me. You and I need to be multifaceted. Some people need God's mercy. Some people need a bold kick in the shins. Some people need grace. Some need truth. Jesus was not one-dimensional. He was multifaceted. Now, we all have leanings. I'm more of a mercy guy. Other people are different. But, you know, sometimes mercy needs to have tough mercy. You know, maybe you're a little bit tougher. Sometimes you need to learn to, to walk in that mercy. Be multifaceted, whatever the occasion needs. The four faces of the angel the four faces of Jesus, the lion, the ox, the, uh, the man, and the eagle. Amen. Go we stand together. 